Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the um, third session in the spring 2022 Sonu Kisis Digital Classics um, uh, semester. This, this semester, we're focusing on digital approaches to cultural heritage. And um, for this session uh, today, we're focusing on 3D imaging and specifically 3D imaging in the context of uh, museums and, and, and research and other things that we do in museums um, involving, um, involving 3D imaging. Um, this, this session um, will be primarily led by um, uh, colleagues uh, Dan Pett from the Fitzwilliam and Dan O'Flynn from the British Museum um, with some rather minor contributions from myself um, and uh, my co-organizers um, Monica Berti and Paula Granados Garcia are also here with us um, in the um, in the call. Um, for those of you who are watching live um, there is a live chat feature to the right or below the video in YouTube please um, please use that feature please um, you know say hi if um, if you're there now use it to ask questions leave comments join the discussion at the um, in the latter part of this in this video. Um, there's um, links um, to um, readings, bibliography, some of the software and websites we'll be talking about in the session page, which um, if you've come to this directly through YouTube, you'll find the session page if you expand the, uh, the comments immediately below the video uh, with uh, see more. Um, there's a link to the, to the session page and there'll be various things and, and also a suggested exercise, which we'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, at the end. Um, where we'll be, we'll be suggesting that you go away and try out some photogrammetry and create a 3D model of, um, of an object, whether a heritage object or a teddy bear as, um, as you choose, um, or anything in between. Um, I think that's, um, that's probably all we need to say by way of um, introduction, unless anyone has anything they else they want to um, remind me. Um, so I wanted to start this session before, um, uh, Dan Dan Pett is going to go to speak first about um, the um, some of the museum content, but um, I wanted to start very briefly for maybe just a few minutes, um, talking a bit about putting this in the context of some of the other sessions that we're talking about this semester. In particular, we've got two or three other sessions on various other three D topics, um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about what we mean by three D and what we mean by three um, D imaging in particular. Um, so if I can just um, but the slides, um, so yeah, when we're talking about um, 3D image, 3, 3D in general, there's a range of different 3D methods um, that, that can be covered by that. And it, it's sometimes useful to, to maybe just um, disambiguate between those um, uh, just a little bit. Um, 3D imaging we're talking about today. This is um, this is the process of capturing um, an object. It can be a heritage object like this this um, carbonized papyrus from Herculaneum that's being laser scanned, um, or it can be um, some any other kind of object. And we're, we're capturing this um, using using some technology to create a 3D model that is a replica of this existing object. It's the 3D equivalent of taking a photograph, which is a 2D um, 2D imaging, right? Um, there's there's many different technologies as we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, the, the, so this is sometimes called 3D imaging, 3D scanning. Um, the the second thing that we sometimes talk about, um, which can be can be easily confused with this, is is um, sometimes referred to as 3D modeling, um, which is potentially confusing because 3D imaging produces a model as well. Um, but when we talk about 3D modeling or 3D visualization, we're talking about building a model of something that doesn't necessarily exist. It may be because it doesn't exist anymore. It's now fragmentary and we're reconstructing it. Um, 3D reconstruction might be another, another term used for this. Um, we're, um, you know, we may just have the foundations um, of, of a temple in, in Pompeii as, as, as here. It's been um, reconstructed in this um, in this. Uh, drawing this painting, um, but it could also be reconstructed using 3D 3D tools. Um, and so, so 3D modeling is basically the same sort of technology as, as architectural uh, modeling. It's also creating a model of something that doesn't exist because it doesn't exist yet because it's being designed for, for future use. And of course, not all 3D um, architectural designs end up being built. Um, then there's the, the technology of virtual reality, where um, this can involve um, creating a model either from, from imaging or, or visualization, um, but putting this model into um, an environment where you can, by use of goggles, such as the person in this, in this picture is wearing, um, or um, indeed just on a, just on a, a computer or, or phone screen, 
um, and making this into an immersive environment. So either in a photorealistic way or in a way that, uh, that is enhanced in some way with either game elements or more information elements, um, you, you effectively, you're, you're projecting a very slightly different image into each eye and um, you, you can then move around inside either using some sort of gyroscopic um, features of the device or just using um, you know, commands like a mouse or a keyboard to move around inside a location or around an object. Um, and to get this, the, the illusion of 3D movement around that using, using virtual reality. Um, a slightly different um, feature than that is, is um, known as augmented reality. And this, this normally involves a single, single screen rather than the dual screens that are used in virtual reality. Um, but what it does is it superimposes the 3D um, resource on what is being seen through the camera on that device. So in this example, you're looking at some ruins and you point your phone or your tablet at those ruins. And so you see the, the, the ruins or you see the, the, the landscape in which the ruins previously were on your screen and the software superimposes a reconstruction of that ancient building on the um, device. This is, this is widely used both in architecture, uh, um, archeological um, functions and um, in, in gaming. Um, there's there's you know famous versions where you you, you wander around you know a so-called haunted castle um, and when you're you're looking at the um, the landscape of the building around you at certain places um, if you if you're always looking at it through your tablet um, at certain places a ghost will appear um, on your tablet screen which which isn't there in the background um, presumably um, and will um, and you know you interact with it in that way and, and th this can be really immersive. Um, in terms, you know, because you're, you're you're looking through the screen, you're seeing what you expect to be really there, and um, you know something then appears which isn't there, and it, it gets this real, um, this real, the visceral sense of it being um, of it being there. Um, and the final, um, the final uh, 3D technology I want to talk about in this very sort of lightning overview um, of defining our terms is 3D printing, um, which is which is a subset. It's one of one of several features um, um, related to to 3D publishing or dissemination. So um, where um, you, uh, uh, you you've created a three D model and then you you make it available somehow to people outside of the outside of the three D space outside of the space where you've you've created. So three D printing is simply um, it's it's as it's um, as as its name implies you're you're making a three D model um, a physical three D object from your three D model usually by extruding layers of some sort of plastic um, substance um, as shown in this. In this picture, um, um, and we may talk a bit more about that in in a future session in a bit more detail. We're not going to talk much about it here. Um, the 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 sort of flip side of it, the other the other way that people commonly disseminate their three D objects is by uploading them for um, uh, for for download, either for free or for sale or for view online, um, through through a site such as um, such as Sketchfab, which um, again we'll probably talk about again. Um, and um, these these will often let you manipulate the objects on screen, but may also let you download them, um, or may let you order a printed version of them, or something. There, there, there are various ways of disseminating the the three D object through through that space. So that was just by way of, of defining some of our terms when we're talking about three um, D. Um, what 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 do we what do we usually mean when we're talking about those uh, uh, the, those terms such as imaging, modeling, and visualization, and so forth. Um, again, very quickly, just when we talk about 3D imaging, um, there are a few different things, or scanning, there are a few different things that, um, that, are, that are meant by this. Um, and so th these are just a few of the, um, of the key um, technologies that, um, that we might be talking about. And again, this is, this is more for the, in, in the sense of defining our terms than of trying to actually explain in any technical way what these technologies mean, because th there's going to be much more... Um, um, explanation of, of the things at least that we need to know about today in the um, in the uh, uh, the presentations that follow. Um, so the first thing that's worth um, just pointing out is the um, the difference in a couple of different three D imaging outputs and formats. Um, and there's there's a difference um, between a format called a point cloud, which um, which is basically simply um, the uh, the dimensions in three dimensional space of a series of points, usually on the surface, but potentially throughout um, a, um, a three dimensional object. Um, and so each of these points is simply a number with an X, X, Y, and a Z coordinate um, that, that 
the you know you can you can perform calculations on these numbers that will either manipulate the um, the object in space um, or will calculate a surface for it. Um, and this is this is raw data and it's very 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 large data usually. Um, usually slightly more commonly you'll see data in the form of a 3D mesh. This basically has taken the point cloud and has transformed it into a series of triangles of which, which define the surface of this space. Um, and you know the, the simplest way is simply to take the points on the surface and draw lines between them, but, it, but also certain a certain amount of, um, of of you know of lowering of resolution of, of compression can take place in this in this process as well. Um, you don't need a, a, a necessarily a hugely high resolution point cloud for most things that you want to do with a three D model. Um, so so that's that's slight, the, if anyone talks about do you have a mesh or a point cloud this is this is what they mean there are other other formats as well there's um uh there's there's the the voxel format which is um uh, similar to um to to you know a pixelized um a pixelated image in that um each um each block of space um has you know is defined by a one by one by one cube um, within there. And so again, you can have very high resolution, um, but it's essentially defining space as cubes rather than triangles on the surface. And that's that's more commonly used with some of the volumetric um, imaging formats, for example. Um, and you can also define 3D objects through um, through a sort of vector space um, uh, in the sense, um, you know, if, if you picture how, um, how, you know, Minecraft models are built or whatever, things like that, that, um, that, uh, that are done in a slightly different way. Um, so um, just to, to quickly talk about two or three of the most common um, imaging um, methods, I'm not going to go into any detail about any of these at all, um, but just to say um, laser scanning, the most common that people talk about is time of flight. And this is essentially using um, the, the, the fact of having projected a laser onto the object and the time it takes for the laser to get from your emitter to the object and bounce back again to a receiver on the on the on your on the same tool as the emitter um, to calculate the distance um, from from that object. So it's basically calculating the distance at which light gets reflected back. Um, this is this is basic. This this um, is basically the same um, principle as used in in lidar, which is you know can be used to um, to image um, landscapes, and it's used in um, uh, navigation computers as well for for driverless vehicles, for example. Um, laser scanning triangulation tends to work better in a much smaller range, and this is where, um, rather than simply using time of flight, you're using um, two um, lasers coming from slightly different directions, um, and you calculate based on the point at which um, they intersect. Um, I may be oversimplifying that. Um, structured light um, involves um, having a known um, pattern of light, and you know you have uh, how you would expect that to be reflected if you're casting it on a on a perfectly flat surface, and how that is distorted um, allows you to calculate what is the texture and what is the shape of that surface. Um, then there's uh, CT scan, which uses uses um, a series of, of X-rays or similar um, technologies, and there are other volumetric um, technologies which use slightly different wavelengths um, to um, to capture um, not only the surface of an object but the entire um, volume of the object, and you can use that to get to get three D information about the content, um, of things of different densities and different different thicknesses inside. We'll, we'll hear a lot more about that um, um, shortly. Um, and finally, um, photogrammetry or um, structure from motion are uh, very closely related um, technologies that. Um, it, basically, they, they they work on triangulation, but they involve the capture of many, many photographs of an object, which can then be extrapolated into a 3D model of that of that object. And we'll hear a bit more about that later. And you'll also get a chance to try that out um, at the end at the end of this session. Um, yeah, structure for motion um, effectively is is as far as I understand it is basically the same technology as um, as photogrammetry, but it, it's um, uh, it's the difference between taking dozens of photographs and capturing capturing video, which is in a sense just capturing many many photographs um, as well. Um, and finally, what um, I've I've um, I've referred to as a pseudo three D um, is um, is uh, RTI, which um, is very good at capturing um, very, the detailed texture of a a, um, a flattish surface, the detailed geometry of a flattish surface, um, but um, but is largely a visualization technique rather than rather than a three D capture proper 
Um, there, there, are, there are elements of 3D, it's sometimes called two and a half D, but uh, but you'll sometimes hear this talked about. The, dif the difference between this is that the camera always captures the object from exactly the same angle and it's the light source that moves. So it's really the opposite of photogrammetry in that, in that sense. So I think, yeah, that's where I stop. Um, and I'm handing over, I think, to Daniel Pett next. Thanks, Gabby. Um, that was a really interesting foundation for what we're going to talk about today and covered virtually everything that I think me and uh, the curator of photons, Daniel O'Flynn, can talk about. Uh, my name is Daniel Pett. I work at the Fitzwilliam Museum in uh, Cambridge. I've been there for nearly four years now. Before that, I used to work with Dan at the British Museum for nearly 15 years. Dan wasn't there 15 years. He's, he's much younger than that. He's been there about three, I think, before that. Uh, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview about what museums can do with 3D. And um, Gabby just put my presentation on for you. So I'm going to start off with um, where I began. So I began in Bloomsbury with the BM, where I first started to get interested in 3D, then began moving to Cambridge, and then beyond, where we've been doing some stuff in the, the greater world with various other people. I'm not going to go really in depth, because I think Gabby's talked quite a bit about what things are. I'm going to give you a few examples and just see how it goes. And then I think Dan's going to talk about more technolo technologically uh, difficult projects that you need big equipment for, and a lovely lead line box that no one else can get without lots of money. So I'm going to talk about stuff that anyone could do, so it's more democratic. So my adventures in 3D started in 2014, after I saw a lecture from Graham Earl from King's College London at the BM. And I got a grant with Andy Bevan from UCL in 2013 to run a crowdsourcing project, which I think you had a presentation on before in this series. And that's called Micropasts. And we had a project where we wanted people to help us create 3D models of Bronze Age objects. And to do that, we collaborated with people online in the crowdsourcing platform, where they, they drew around the object to provide a photo mask, which we then compiled in some open source software to begin with. And then we tried in the photo scan, which of course you have to pay for. Uh, Micropass allowed us to create 100 3D models. And on the right of my slide, you can see some of the models that we created. So there's some really interesting objects on there. They're not all Bronze Age. You can see some BM objects that are slightly contested. So the Caryatid from uh, Greece, for instance, uh, some objects from the Mary Rose, um, Alexander the Great, and a really interesting mask from, uh, the, from Palestine. So Micropass paid for software to do this project. It paid for a 3D printer, and it paid for processing hardware. It paid for a MacBook Pro for most of us, and I'm still using that from 2014. That software and hardware works really well. But what opportunities did we see? Well, I saw quite a lot of opportunities within 3D technologies for various things. Uh, perhaps the most interesting thing that you can do with 3D technologies is public engagement and what you can actually start doing. But you have to look beyond the spinning object, which is what lots of people think 3D objects as shown as on screen normally. And you can use it as part of your journey towards a total object biography. So it's one of the tools that allows you to tell you about an object. So you can teach directly from it with students and, and members of the public, and you can show them how an object's made, how it can be um, interacted with and what's actually telling you a story about. But you can also apply it within museums. So you can use it for exhibition design, which you're going to come on to, interactive installations, so things like museum in a box or touch screens, uh, for handling objects, so the 3D printing that Gabby talked about right at the end, and the applied scientific imaging that um, Dan's going to talk about. And it can also help you generate new research projects because it gives you new ideas. But it also can be a very cheap and effective imaging technique if you're using structure of motion or photogrammetry. If you're using CT scanning, then you're quite privileged, so most people in the world don't get access to that sort of thing. And I was also really interested in the idea of pushing the boundaries of museum copyright and photography methods. Uh, on the right of my slide, I've got an image from the conference we ran at the British Museum 2017-18, uh, from Mona Hess talking about scientific imaging and how it emerges. So this is just an example of what we did with Micropass, with us asking people to draw around an object. Now, some people were really good at this, some people weren't. But because we were crowdsourcing, we averaged these out to work out who created really good masks, and we used the best ones out of those to help us create a 3D model. Hundreds of these masks got generated from hundreds of images, and with that, you generated your structure of motion model. And here's an example of one of the models that's been made. This is an Ethiopian head, which is quite interesting from the, the British Museum collection. No one knows very much about this object, but a 3D model allows people to actually start talking about it and seeing how it's made and what it's going to be used for. I was also very interested as well about putting objects out under a license that was open, or as open as we could be, which is in direct contravention with the British Museum's normal licensing. So we put it out under CC BY license so that people could actually use it commercially. 
Now that actually pushes the boundaries a little bit with museums. People don't like giving people access to things to make money off. But these objects, there's no copyright in 3D objects. You, if you look at work from say Andy Wallace, she talks about what 3D objects can do. On the top right of the screen, you'll see a white amphora as well. Now, this was a really interesting project that Andy Bevan put together, helping us make 3D models from line drawings of amphora based off uh, several marks being placed on images, and then using something called Blender to turn this into a 3D model. Now, Gabby mentioned the Sketchfab interface. And one of the great things about Sketchfab is it allows, it allows you to annotate images. So you can now tell stories based around um, objects, based on points on them. You can tell stories through uh, text, through audio. You can't put video into it at the moment unless you do an embed. But it's starting to get really useful for giving a, uh, a tool for learning within a museum space. This is an example of one of my friends, uh, Terhi Nemeko Fuller from Australia National University, coming across from Australia. Uh, to do some work with cuneiform tablets within the British Museum. And this was five years ago. Now, she came in and wanted to learn technique, and now she's teaching this in Australia. And she wanted to make models of these objects, print them off, and do some interesting things with them. Uh, after I left the British Museum, I took my toys and I moved off to Cambridge, and I started doing 3D work there. When I got there, we were very lucky that we got access to a structured light scanner, an Artec Leo, which cost nearly £20,000. We had a grant for that. Normally, I use photogrammetry because it's easy to use and you can do all sorts of really good stuff with it. And we started doing things with a company called Museum in a Box, where we put objects into uh, 3D prints, put them in the museum with NFC tags on them, and allow them to tell stories. So on the top right-hand side of this slide, there's three boxes laid out in the Feast and Fast exhibition, with stories being told about the objects in the exhibition. People picked up the object, they touched them with the NFC reader, and they got told a story about them. And we worked in projects with the Egyptian Coffins team, where we were doing reconstruction from CT scanning. We printed off um, scale models of sculpture. So the bottom left is one of the coffins that we interrogated. On the top right is a 3D print of the uh, torso of Dionysus from the uh, Cypriot Gallery in the Fitzwilliam. And we started thinking about how we can use 3D models to inform exhibition design as well. So this is a model made by one of my colleagues, Neil. And he uses these to actually work out where things could be hung within the gallery. So this is in SketchUp. Most people can get SketchUp quite cheaply, but you can produce really nice models of buildings. It's a bit like game reconstruction. And then you can put them into Sketchfab with annotations, which allows you to tell stories about where the objects might go. And you can put them to VR, so people can see objects in different places. Like I say, I hate that gallery hang, or that's really worked out well. So it's a way of actually working out how you might do things in a different space. So if you think about what everyone's talking about now, the metaverse, this is sort of going that direction, but without the sort of caricature uh, faces that you saw in the video that came out yesterday. Uh, this is an example of um, CT scanning being turned into animation. So this is the coffin from the Egyptian uh, team, and they scan this at Anbrook Hospital. Now there's a part missing from this because it was too big to fit in the scanner properly, uh, but we've turned it into a 3D model, which we can turn around and we can tell the story of. And this has been used in Egypt, and it's been put in the gallery, and it's online as a video. And this was made in conjunction with Think C 3D in Oxford. And we went out to Cairo to teach 3D uh, scanning as well, which is really quite difficult in the space they had. We did it in a, a very loud gallery uh, with 30 people around a table, with them each taking one photograph and passing the camera around. And then afterwards, we made a 3D model from the object uh, photographs that they generated. So they all felt they'd partly contributed to this, but they all wanted to know far more. The problem there was getting access to hardware to use to produce the 3D models and for who's, who would have access to that computing hardware after we left. But we did quite a bit of modelling while we were there and that was just done by going around the museum with them, showing them what to do and then producing 3D models afterwards. And the last thing I'm going to talk about, because I think I'm coming up to nearly nine minutes of talking now, um, is about guerrilla photogrammetry. So anyone can produce 3D models with a camera. All they need is a mobile phone camera or a digital SLR, and you can walk around a museum and you can take photographs and you can compile them to, to a 3D model quite simply based on simple software and making sure your photographs overlap. And on the right of this slide, I've got a, a map, a heat map of uh, photographs I've taken in the British Museum, which shows you where I've been. I've been in quite a lot of areas of that place. And I've produced lots of 3D models of objects that are on public display. So I've scanned the Parthenon marbles and I've scanned all the Assyrian reliefs. Now, all these models are out in the public domain for people to use as uh, 3D data. And in the link to the teaching materials, there's a folder of photogrammetry images that you can download. Some of these images are in there. 
So it'd be really interesting what you did with this fresh gravity data and whether you used it for putting it into gaming software, whether you printed them off, or whether you created new experiences with this stuff. After all, this is archaeological material. It's been around for years and years. And it's not in its home location. So it allows you to think about decolonization in different ways. You can use it for your own research. You could do all sorts of new stuff with this. So that's the end of what I was going to talk about. I think that's 10 minutes of talking now. Um, over to you, Dan O'Flynn, I think. Cheers, Dan. Thanks very much. Um, so my name is Dan O'Flynn and I um, work in the British Museum and my my job title is um, X-ray Imaging Scientist. And then um, the department I work in is a department called Scientific Research and we're about 100 years old. Um, and what I just want to do very briefly before I talk about what I do is just to show you where we sit in the museum and what what kind of what what my job is. So, so why why do we use X-ray imaging is, is a very important question. So, the questions I usually need to answer are how an object was made. So, I'm looking at the materials or the techniques involved in making a, an object. What its current condition is. So, I might be looking for subsurface cracks or any evidence of repairs or restoration. And then the kind of exciting one is, is there anything hidden inside? And that's where we might have a container which we can't open or a bundle which we can't unwrap and we want to know what's inside it. So our department sits in the, this is the, the British Museum viewed from above and the building I'm based in is in the northwest corner. And if we look at that building as a cross section, this is it. And, and then there's lots of different, um, rooms in this building the the one that you may have seen is the large exhibition gallery on on the ground floor which is where the stonehenge exhibition is going to be taking place quite soon and underground under all of the um or under all of that are lots of storage space for um parts of the collection which aren't currently on display and also the labs which are used by the department of scientific research and the lab i work in is on the very bottom floor because it needs to be well, there's lots of heavy equipment and it needs to be shielded because there's lots of uh, radiation in there. So this is what this is what the lab I work in looks like. So this is um, a brief kind of schematic of what the lab is. We have an X-ray tube on the on the right hand side and an imaging detector on the left hand side. And when I turn the X-ray tube on, I get a picture on the detector and I can put something in between the two and I can see inside it and, and um, we can rotate that object around in the middle whilst we're taking pictures of it. And that's very important for CT scanning. So just a very brief slide on terminology because I know that not everyone is familiar with all these terms. So when I talk about a radiograph or an X radiograph, that's what you might traditionally think of as an X ray that you have in the hospital. And that's a two dimensional image. And when I talk about CT scan, that is a three-dimensional image. And, and in order to take a CT scan, you need to take lots of individual images and then reconstruct afterwards a 3D picture. And when you have your CT scan, you can view it in lots of different ways. So the, the image I show on the right-hand side here is of, um, of a human torso as a volume render. So it's a 3D picture. You can also, you can also view that as a series of slices and those slices look for example, like this. And what I want to show you in this talk is why we would use a CT scan rather than a radiograph. Why, why is it more useful to see that? And, and you might see already here that there are lots more features that you can see inside the body on a CT scan. So when you have lots of overlapping, complicated um, material, it, a CT scan is a really good way to separate that out, where in a radiograph, it all gets overlapped on top of each other and, and smeared out. So what I want to do is just give two kind of case studies of where I've been using CT scanning in the British Museum over the last few years. So firstly, I want to talk about cuneiform tablets. Um, cuneiform is, is one of the earliest um, writing systems, and uh, the name comes from the Latin for wedge-shaped. And in order to create this text, um, a, a piece of, for example, reed was impressed into the surface, as you can see in this, this reconstruction on the left hand side here, into, into a clay surface. And the two tablets to the, to the right of that are um, quite well-known tablets. So the, the one in the middle 
is the so-called first day of school tablet. And that's um, thought to be from young people who were learning how to become scribes. And they would practice by writing the same character repeatedly on, on a tablet. So this, this tablet just consists of the same character repeated again and again. The, the tablet on the right is called Plimpton 322 tablet. This is a Babylonian clay tablet from about 1800 BC. It's about 13 centimeters across. And this is very famous because it shows mathematical tables and they're actually um, the first examples of Pythagorean triples. So the A squared plus B squared equals C squared. This is this predates Pythagoras by about 1000 years. So I um, want to show you an example here. So it, another, another, some other reasons you might, they might have written on um, clay tablets in this time period where um, there could have been recipes, letters of correspondence or, or details of administration. And, and this, um, this tablet I show here is the, is the latter type. So this is an, an administrative document. And what it actually is, is a clay tablet, which is enclosed inside a clay envelope. So we have clay inside clay and both the envelope and the tablet have writing on them. And what I wanted to do is to read the writing on the, on the tablet on the inside, but obviously we can't break open the envelope because we, we were not in, in the, in the habit of destructively um, examining samples of the, like that. So what I wanted to know is could we use CT scanning to get inside there? So when we do a CT scan, what we do is take a radiograph like this, and then we rotate the, the sample a little bit, and then we take another radiograph, and then we rotate a little bit more, and we keep going until we've done a full 360 degree rotation, and we have acquired lots of images, and then we use those to, to make a 3D volume afterwards. So what I'm showing you here on the right-hand side is a, is a radiograph of this tablet and envelope, or it can also be called a projection. And the yellow arrows are pointing to the, the gap between the tablet and the envelope. So you can see this dark outline surrounding the tablet. So all this tells me right now is that there's a complete tablet inside the envelope, but it doesn't tell me what's written on it. And this are, these are my projections. So these are the, um, the raw data that I use to, to, to make my CT scan. So that's 360 degrees of, of images around the tablet. And again, we still don't see any writing there. So this is what we then end up with. We end up with a series of slices, just like with the, the human body image I showed earlier. And I've just picked a few out just to, to give you an example. So there are two, there's a blue and a, and a yellow kind of cross section through the, um, through the center of the, the tablet and the envelope. And hopefully you can see that same outline around the um, the tablet there, and this is kind of looking at it as if you if you cut it straight across the middle and you're looking top down. That's what these two slices are showing, and the the, the CT scan it, it gives you a map of the density of an object. So it's telling you the grey bits are where there's clay and the black bits are where there's nothing or air. And what I want to show you. Um, are these where I've highlighted with purple arrows? You can see these triangular indentations in the in the surface of the tablet, and this is because, as we saw before, the, the cuneiform is written by making indentations in the surface. So what you end up with are small air gaps inside the inside the envelope on the surface of the tablet, and that's what we wanted to pull out. So the, this is looking at the CT as slices. We can also look at as the CT as a volume render, and that's what we're looking at here. So as Dan and Gabby mentioned earlier, this isn't just the surface of the, of the tablet and the envelope. We can then peel away our outside layers and go inside. So that's what we're doing here. And these triangles that are appearing now, this is the writing on the inside. So this is writing that was written about 4,000 years ago, sealed in an envelope and hasn't been seen since. So I was able to, to process that data and come up with an image that looked like this. And so my background is in physics and I'm not able to read this kind of text, but luckily I work in, in a museum where we have scholars who are able to do this. So I, I took this image to a curator called John Taylor in the, um, the British Museum's Middle East department. And then he translated the text to show, to show what was written there. And, and it gives a description for a large quantity of wool that was transferred from 
a city called Gersu to a small village called Gaka. And it has the names of the, the people involved in the transaction, the quantity of wool, the, um, the year in which it took place, and also the, the person who was the administrator who sealed the envelope. So it's um, a really nice non-destructive way to get an insight into, into um, the day-to-day -day life in ancient Mesopotamia. And one more example of cuneiform I want to show you is, this is an example of um, a tablet which is has an encrust, encrusted layer of salt on one of the surfaces. So the left-hand image is one side of the tablet where the text is very visible. The middle image is the reverse side of the tablet, which is encrusted with salt, which completely obscures the writing on it. And underneath those, that, that is a quote. And this quote is from Alexander Scott, who is the the founder and first director of scientific research at the British Museum. So he founded our department back in uh, 1919. And he mentions that, you know, the inscriptions are uncovered up and, and there was no attempt made to take the salt off the surface because there's a risk to damage of the tablet. So they have remained in that condition. And on the right hand side is another um, CT slice through the middle of this tablet. And on the, on the left-hand side of the images are clean side without salt. And on the right-hand side is the, is the, the, um, the salt part. And the salt is showing up here is a little bit brighter. And the reason for that is that salt is a bit denser than the, um, than the clay. And that's, that means it's better at stopping x-rays, which means it shows whiter on our, on our CT scan. And again, as before, I've used some arrows to just point at the surface where the salt is that shows some triangular shaped indentations. And what we're able to do with an image like this is to digitally delete salt afterwards. So here we are uncovering the writing that's under the surface of the salt. Again, completely non-destructively. So moving on to another example, which um, is that of an ancient Egyptian mummy mask. This is a funerary mask, which would have covered the, the head and part of the upper body of the deceased. And this mask has an unknown provenance and was acquired by the British Museum in 1897. And I was studying a series of these masks with a curator in, in the, our department of Egypt and Sudan called Marie van den Bush. And we were trying to understand how they were manufactured. So the, the mask itself is made from a material called cartonnage, which is a, a textile mixed with a plaster and, or glue, so, sort of like paper mache. And that would have been formed over a mold of a face, not, not a real um, human face, but probably a statue. And, um, and once that was um, set, then various layers would have been applied on the top. So what we can see in um, an RCT scan. So we have a picture of the mask in the lab on the left-hand side. In the middle is our volume render of the mask. And on the right-hand side is a, is a cross section right through the center of the, the face. And what you can see is that the the, the lighter gray, the, the, sorry, the darker gray part is the textile layer, the cartonnage layer, and then and the brighter bit on the outside is a material called gesso, which is a, a binding material mixed with chalk or gypsum or, or a pigment of some sort. And um, you can see on the on this cross section that the textile layer is thicker at the nose. This is probably a deliberate reinforcement of the the fragile area of the mask where the nose was. And on the on the surface, after the after the gesso layer was applied on the surface of the mask, obviously it's gold. And what, what happened was the the mask was gilded and painted, and that's what we see up in our finished mask. And if I zoom in on the on the, the volume render, where I've indicated the arrows here are where there is overlap between the different um, pieces of gold leaf that we used for the gilding process. And it's very easy to disguise those on the surface by, by burnishing them, which essentially is rubbing the, the joins until they disappear. But you can see the overlaps very clearly in an X-ray CT scan. So we, um, we looked at uh, um, a series of masks from, from the late period of Egypt. We also looked at a slightly, slightly later mask from the, from the Roman period. And um, I just wanted to show you this very quickly because it was um, a very different technique in the manufacture of the mask at this point. So on, on the mask on the left, the um, all the detail was on the inside and then successive layers got added on the top, such that the, the outside of the mask is actually a bit less detailed than the inside. And, and when I show you, I'll show you soon the, um, the inside of the mask so I can show you what I mean. But um, on the right hand side, 
all of the detail of the face so the lips and the nose were all added outside of the mask and this this mask on the right belonged to a woman named Aphrodite and and the mask was excavated at Havara by um, Flinders Petrie in the in the 1880s and uh, this mask and, and others of its type were, were considered to be cartonnage suggesting a similar production as, as the masks on the left but as we showed with CT scanning they're actually quite different so there's there's a rough kind of clay mold then it may be a textile let textile layer and then and then as I say everything was added on the outside so the last thing I wanted to show you just to finish on really was just to kind of link with what Dan Pet and Gabby were talking about so and what I'm really interested in is the combination of different 3D imaging methods and one of the issues you might have noticed with X-ray CT scanning is that you don't preserve any color information on the surface you just get what's you just get a map of density in 3D. So sometimes it's really nice to combine the two, especially when you have a, such a beautifully decorated object as um, a mummy mask. And I was quite lucky that when I was CT scanning these masks, Dan Pett and Amelia Nolson were in the museum. And, and this is a photo of Amelia here with, a, with an Artec spider structured light scanner. And Amelia at the time was, was um, visiting research at the British Museum as part of her PhD at Sheffield Hallam University. And she, she had this structured light scanner and I wanted to scan the mummy mask. So this is just a very brief video that I took on my phone of her scanning the mask. So what I was able to do after this was to, was to link together my CT scan of the mask with, with Amelia's structured light scan of the surface. So we kind of have a skin and then what's underneath the surface afterwards. And that's what I'm going to show you now. So the, um, the structured light scan shows lots of nice information. So there's the, um, the text surrounding the, the scarab on the top, which is an extract of a spell from the Book of the Dead. There's four gods on the back of the mask, which are probably Osiris, Horus, Isis, and Sekhmet. And there's, there's lots of text on the back of the mask as well. And then if we switch to the X-ray CT mode, then this is what, what I was talking about earlier. We can see the overlap of the gold leaf on the surface of the mask. And then as we rotate the mask around, we're now going to get a view of the inside. And this was not possible to scan with a 3D scanner because of the shape of the mask. So this is now the impression of the, the mold that was used to create the mask. We kind of, we've preserved, that's preserved on the inside of the mask. And you can see how detailed this mold would have been. So the ears, for example, are much more detailed on the inside than they are on the outside. And what we've done here is we've created a, a 3D model of what the mask looks like on the inside that allows us for future research we can um we can compare different masks to see if similar molds are being used and also we can you know that can be shared for, to collaborate research with other institutions who who have their um, masks in their collections also so that's that's essentially it. that's what i wanted to to finish on i just wanted to acknowledge everyone who was involved in the work that i um showed today and also if it's of interest, the, the software that I use. So for all of the, the 3D rendering that I showed you, I used a program called VD Studio Max, which is from a company called Volume Graphics. That's a commercial software. But for the for the two-dimensional slices and 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 um, the, the flat data, I use a program called ImageJ, which is an open source software. And I've um, put the link to that below. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Great, thanks very much, Dan. That's um, that's brilliant. Um, sorry, because I can to find the buttons. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, um, thanks so much, both of you, um, for those um, those presentations. I think there's some really useful examples there, and um, and and we've also we've we've sort of started to pick at some of the um, some of the reasons why you would use three D three D imaging, three D scanning. Um, in 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 the context of a, of a heritage institution, um, you know this can include, as um, as Dan Pett said at the beginning, um, public engagement. It can be useful for for teaching. It can be useful for accessibility. It can be useful for 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 various ways of of engaging the the public, both present and remote, with with some of these objects and some of the features of subject. Um, and it can also be used um, for for discovering new things about them, for 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 learning, you know, creating new knowledge. Um, new research um, in ways that we we couldn't have done certainly couldn't have done non-destructively um, in the past 
Um, and, um, and I think all of the sorts of technologies we talked about today can be used for that range of different uses. I mean, photogrammetry can certainly be used for discovering new knowledge as well. It can be used to, you know, do calculations about the volume of an object and things like that. Um, and so forth. So I think that, that that's a really interesting to think about the different reasons why um, we um, we use these sorts of technologies. I don't know if either of you want to um, to come back on on my my sort of oversimplification of the different uses of of three D that uh, that I made there. I think um, that that aspect of sharing it and making it accessible is a very important one, and I. I, I have a lot, a lot of dialogue with people in the museum about that. Like, how, what's the best way to share complicated data sets like CT scans with the public? Because there's, there's a lot of interest, I think, but it's also very complicated and the data sets are very large. So that's a big challenge for us. So when I, when I take a CT scan, it's tens of gigabytes of data that I'm generating. And I can show videos in a, in a PowerPoint presentation or, or such. But um, it's, it's nice to think of creative ways of, of sharing data with with the public and also with with other researchers in, in different institutions yeah um, people often talk also about um the the conservation aspect of, of 3d imaging it allows you to do things um that that mean you don't have to handle the object as much you don't have to you know interfere with the object as much um you know you can you can make close up views of the object available, you know, either through the museum's website or or on-site technology or um, or on, you know, on request um, in ways that mean less, you know, fewer people have to handle the object. Um, you know, objects, objects may, some objects may be too fragile to be on display at all, just, you know, being light sensitive or something and, and making those sort of things accessible. Um, so I think those, those, those are also really useful um, applications, yeah. Yeah, I think um, also, so what you know, we're, people often make 3D models or like 3D prints based on structured light scans or photogrammetry. And you can do that with a CT scan as well. So you mm -hmm. can CT scan something that's inside something, and then you can hold something and it, it makes things a bit more tangible sometimes. So there's that really nice. So um, I think you showed Sovet very briefly in your in your opening slides, the crocodile mummy that's in the, mm -hmm. in the British Museum. And then in the stomach of that crocodile are the bones of a, of a baby cow. And they were 3D printed so, and, I've, and I've handled them and it, and it made it seem a lot more real to, to hold them in my hands. Yeah. yeah. Gabby, I'm afraid I've got to go because my daughter's demanding I take it swimming. Um, okay. Both really interesting talks from you and, and uh, Dan. And I think that really sets the scene. If anyone wants to ask me questions, um, I'm easy to get hold of on Twitter or by email. Um, I respond quicker by Twitter if, if people want to answer, but I'm very willing to help out if they, they want to. Um, but thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. Thanks very much, Dan. That's really that's really generous of you. Yeah, great. Um, okay, we, we're starting to see a few questions on the um, on the live chat. Maybe before we go to those, we can come back to, to this discussion in a bit more detail. I wanted to, to just very quickly talk about the, um, the suggested exercise for this session, which was... Um, uh, so it's a suggested exercise for anyone who might want to take take part. It's slightly stronger than a suggestion for for my students, but um, for other people, it's um, it's uh, it's just a suggestion, um, which is to, um, uh, to to try out photogrammetry, which is one of the three D imaging technologies we've talked about um, for yourself, um, and create a three D model of that object, which um, which you can then you know bring along or bring along screenshots of or whatever, and and, and you know talk about. Um, in um, in a class context, um, so just sort of very quickly in terms of um, what that involves. Um, firstly, you need to just choose an object to um, to image. Ideally, it should be an object that is neither translucent nor shiny. Those are the two real problems. Um, think the main issues that will cause you issues with um, with photogrammetry um, and with many imaging techniques. Um, and uh, an object that you can get to um, to all faces of. Um, so if you're if you're thinking of a of a of a, of a monument, an outdoor object, um, you know, pick an object that isn't taller than you are because you want to be able to photograph the the top of it. Um, but if it's an object that you know that you have to hand, 
um, then um, then it can be it can be more or less anything. So so just by way of, of example, and so you know the 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 points I'm going to make here they they scale. So you can you can image a relatively small object, or you can image you know a, a, as I say an outdoor um, monument. Um, I'm really going to give a very um, a very very uh, sort of abbreviated um, uh, sort of tutorial in how you take photographs of an object for purposes of, of photogrammetry. And um, there are much more detailed tutorials, again, linked in the session page above this. There's um, under other resources, the first um, the first item under there is photogrammetry tutorials from the University of London. There's a bunch of, of uh, short YouTube videos that were made by uh, myself and a few other colleagues, um, which cover all of this in much more detail. Um, but um, just as a sort of very quick sort of intro, you um, the first thing you want to do is uh, you want to take your object and um, put it somewhere um, stable and evenly lit. Um, so natural light is obviously the best, but if you're doing this outdoors, the best light you can possibly get will be around uh, around midday on a slightly overcast day. So it's not in direct sunlight. It doesn't have very strong shadows, um, but um, but it is is well lit. Obviously, if you're doing it indoors, try and try and do it where there's relatively even lighting, um, and that you can get to the object all the way around without having to move the object, because moving the object can make it harder for the software to um, to understand what's what's going on in terms of the the geometry of the object and and what what photographs align to to each other. Um, one way to give the software a clue would be to place your object on a flat tabletop on which you've spread a newspaper, for example, or something similar to that, so that it can use the background of the newspaper to um, to, to align each image to to one another. Um, so, just for the purposes of this um, of this demonstration, I'm going to use this uh, this object, which is um, a 3D print, as it happens. But um, let's pretend for the purposes of this that this is um, a, a heritage object. Um, and I'm, I'm going to take this object, I'm going to place it um, on something, I'll place it on something more stable than your hand, but I, I don't have a table that's visible from, from this camera. Um, and you're going to want to take photographs of this, of this object um, from every possible angle. And you want to try and keep the photographs um, in, in focus and, um, and steady um, and from, from a roughly the same distance. You don't need to measure the distance, but but take the photographs from the same distance as much as you can. Um, you know, don't don't keep sort of zooming in and out and taking photographs from all over. The um, you want each point on the object to appear in at least two photographs, by which means that each photograph should overlap by at least forty percent with the photograph next to it. The easiest way to do this is to take your photographs, moving around the object, and then moving. To, to another layer and take them from further up, and then the final layer and, and do them from further up, rather than just sort of moving around and taking photographs randomly and hoping you've got everything. But whatever whatever works for you, um, as long as you capture you know every part of the object. Um, once you've captured every part of the object, um, just check: did you also capture any overhanging parts, like under the chin? Um, on um, Nefertiti, I should try and not have her against a dark background. Um, under the chin there, under the under the nose, um, under the back of the thing, and on the top. That's the most commonly forgotten thing. Obviously, if it's flat on a surface, you won't be able to get the underside. If it's an object that has an underside that's of interest, you may want to image that in in you know in a separate process and um, and stitch the objects together. There, there's a video about that in the um, tutorials I just I just uh, mentioned, giving suggestions on how to do that. That's slightly more advanced. You you might want to. Um, just leave. Assume you've got a flat base um, for the for the moment. So um, you can use any kind of camera for this. Um, a cell phone camera is absolutely perfect. Um, so I'm I'm taking my uh, my phone and I'm taking photographs of first the lower um, surface and I'm working around making sure that each photograph overlaps by at least forty percent with the one before. I go up to a second layer, take another range of photographs, bearing in mind that that layer should also overlap by forty percent with the layer below. Um, and so on up until the top, and then I add images of the top of the object, images taken from underneath. And if you're, if there are some parts that are particularly complex, you can take close-ups. Um, although try not to use a, um, a artificial zoom or so forth. Try not to use a flash because that will also interfere with the lighting and make it much more difficult for the um, for the object to be to be captured. All of what I've just said there applies equally if you're doing an object inside a vase, um, a, a printed object like that, your favourite teddy bear or a, a monument or a tombstone or something outdoors. Um, I, um, 
The only thing I'll add to that um, at the moment is that when you then look at your photographs, um, read in prior to processing them, um, go through, look for the photographs and any photographs you find in there that are out of focus or are overexposed or underexposed, so are much brighter or much darker than all of the others, throw them away. They, they, they'll they'll just make the, the object worse rather than rather than better. If you find then that in, when removing all the out of focus ones, you don't have any photographs of the right hand side of the face anymore, go back and take some more, assuming you haven't moved the object in between. If you've moved the object, you probably want to start again from scratch. So maybe take twice as many photographs as you think you need and then delete half of them um, to, to make sure you've got the ones. If you're a terrible photo photographer like me, um, take three times as many as you think you'll need because you'll have to delete a lot more. Um, but um, that's that's the, the basic process of capturing those photographs. You probably want for an object of this sort of size, so, so the sort of thing we're going to talk about for our exercise, you probably want somewhere between, say, let's say 30 and 50 photographs. Um, 30 is probably absolutely fine. Um, more than 50 is really is really unnecessary and will just slow down the capture. You can you can do it with you know 200 photographs, but for, for the process for the processing that we want to do later, um, you know, more than 50 is really going to slow it down quite quite a lot, especially if you've got um, good high resolution photographs. Um, I'm not going to go into now the um, the details of how to process these photographs um, using the photogrammetry software. Um, we're suggesting you use Agisoft Metashape. Um, and again, on the session page linked below this video um, in the um, in the photogrammetry tutorials, there is um, a couple of videos on, on how to use Metashape. Um, the main one um, is, is, is here. This is a, a walkthrough. It's about 11 minutes long of the various steps you need to go through when turning, um, you know, 50 or so photographs into a 3D model in Metashape. Um, that, that was produced by my colleague Alicia Walsh for a, for a, a summer school we ran last year, um, and um, you you know from from this sort of general photography tutorial through to that um, that MetaShape walkthrough, you should be enough to to get um, to get you started. There are more videos available in that in that set of tutorials if you want to have a look um, uh, at some some other features, some other tricks, some other things you might want to look out for. But this probably sh should be enough to get you started. Um, you'll probably find. Um, and um, I don't know if, how everyone else um, feels about this, but um, almost everybody I've ever known who's learned fo learned photogrammetry, the very first model you make is a disaster. It just doesn't come out. You know, it ends up with three heads. You know, something something you know goes horribly wrong. After you've done it two or three times, you realize what went wrong, and it's very 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 quick. And simply, it's just simply the more times you do it, the better images, better models you will end up with um, coming coming out of it. Um, it's a very very easy to learn. Um, it really is a matter of making sure you don't try to align out of focus photographs and making sure you you, you have enough photographs and you have um, high enough resolution, um, uh, high, high enough uh, uh, quality um, in your settings for the, um, for the for the for the processing. Um, so the exercise really is just to give that a go. You'll probably need to give it give it two or three goes to, to get it right going. So you know use relatively low quality um, settings on. Um, on MetaShape because at the lowest quality, the, the whole process of creating the model will only take a few minutes. If you were to go at relative, even just medium quality, you might find that one of the steps takes 20 minutes. If you try and use high quality, you could end up leaving it overnight. I mean, it, it really does um, become exponentially slower the longer, um, the, 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 the more um, work you ask the software to do, especially if you're running it on a, you know, on a standard laptop. Um, so that's about it for the, for the exercise, give it a go. Take it, you know. Take your your questions and your results to class next week and see um see how that uh, see how that came out. Um, did anyone else want to add anything else before we go to the uh, the chat for questions? Okay, so we have a couple of questions then in the in the chat from um from Eden. So. We have a question saying, is there a legal copyright issue with making 3D models of objects that are owned by museums or private collectors? Who wants to come in on that one? I might not be the best person to answer this question because I don't um, tend to do this, but um, I, I feel like it's kind of an evolving field in terms mm. of what, what people's advice and guidance is on this. And, um, and I'm not totally sure that I've, I think I feel like I've heard different um, approaches from different mm. institutions on this as well. Um, 
yeah, I think this is a kind of a similar subject, this question. This is, yeah, so, this is, yeah. I, I, I mean, my, my instant reaction is that it's kind of like a photograph. And if you take a photograph of something in the museum, it's a photograph, <laughs> but you can't use it to make a profit. So you, you couldn't, I think, I think if it's from a museum collection, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure totally. To be honest, I wouldn't want to say something that was healthy later. I think. I think. I think that's that's a, a good point. That the um, the copyright issues are probably not much different from from a photograph. Um, they probably are slightly different, but um, but in most cases, um, you, know, you can take a photograph of something um, in in some museums. Some museums don't allow photography. Some museums allow handheld photography, but not tripod photography, for example. Um, some museums um, don't make a, a particular deal out of this, but, but other museums, such as the British Museum, have an explicit, um, uh, 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 what's the word, um, a, a license uh, applied to that, which is that if you go into the British Museum and take a photograph, you're agreeing that the photograph still belongs to the British Museum. It's on your camera and you can do all sorts of things with it, but but it's still their copyright, um, the museum's the museum's copyright. And presumably the same is true of, of 3D models, although presumably the kind of quality you would need to do good photogrammetry of an object in the middle of the British Museum would probably be pretty hard to do and may even um, be prevented from doing so. Um, I don't I don't know. If you were just doing it as a member of the public, if you'd gone in and asked for permission, that's a different um, that's a different question, and they, they could set you up with that. Um, just to just to add to that, actually, because I, I saw the end of the question about um, exceptions for non-profit or educational purposes. Mm -hmm. we, we often do have um, academics coming in to, to 3D scan objects in the British Museum collection, and then they, they're used for research projects. And there's usually some sort of agreement put in place that, you know, that, that specifies that that's what it's being used for. So that, that does happen quite a lot. Yeah, and uh, to, just also to stress that it really does depend on the institution. Um, some institutions just won't allow that sort of thing at all. Some institutions don't claim copyright on their own on their own objects. Um, there's there's a certain amount of sort of ethical debate about whether an institution really has the ethical right to claim copyright on an object that is a hundreds of years old, thousands of years old, um, and b um, you know almost certainly in, in many cases, let's say, you know, brought over from other parts of the world in more colonial periods of, of history and, um, and you know, who, who can. And, and so, you know, my, my, my choice of the, uh, the Nefertiti bust was not entirely um, arbitrary um, here. And this, this may well be discussed in a few weeks time. Um, the, um, the issue that the, the Berlin Museum um, uh, um, that, that holds this, um, the original of this bust um, originally had, um, uh, a, a high resolution 3D model made of this, um, but was not released to the public and was, you know, was considered was considered the copyright of the of the museum, which was, you know, um, angered a lot of people. And there was there was an interesting issue of, of you know, um, someone who um, allegedly made a sort of guerrilla photogrammetry with a hidden camera um, of the object, which probably was more likely that it was a it was actually a leaked copy of, of a high resolution 3D scan, but all sorts of, you know, challenges and protests to the to the legality and to, and to the to the ethics of, of claiming copyright on that so it's it's a it's a complex question and it's there's aspects to it which you know the terms of service um the terms of use of the of the museum may make one claim um and others may claim that that's not always something that would stand up in a court and a lot of these things haven't been tested you know in, in legal cases um and I guess we should we should both make the usual disclaimer that neither of us are lawyers and nothing we've said in this video should constitute be, be taken as constituting legal advice. Um, but um, yeah, if if in doubt, check the museum's terms of service because they may they may they may they almost certainly will make an explicit claim about this. Yeah, if it's not on if it's not on the British Museum website, there's certainly mm -hmm. an email address where you can ask for yeah. questions like that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Anyone else want to come in on that? I mean, we probably will talk more about intellectual property in later in later sessions, but I don't know if either Paula or Monica wanted to say anything. I think there's another question, but I have a question. There are, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. I mean, just specifically on the question of intellectual property. Uh, no, 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 it's not about that. Okay. Did you want to ask something else then? We, we'll also come to Megan's question in a moment. 
Okay, so no, I have a question about papyri because at the beginning, Abby, you showed the example of carbonized papyri from Herculaneum and uh, using computer tomography today is possible to read the text inside those papyri that we can't open because otherwise we destroy them. And so my question is for Dan, so we, uh, we know that we have papyri, um, that papyri were used also for, for uh, uh, cartonage, for producing those masks. Uh, but is it possible to use uh, this 3D method for... Um, I don't think that we can read papyri, but can we see if uh, uh, papyri were used inside and uh, maybe try to read them or find the traces of them within a, a mask, a cartonage mask? Do you have examples of that? Um, I don't have personal like use examples. Um... It, again, as I was saying before, when you when you do an X-ray CT, you get a map of density. So, if the writing on the papyrus is in an ink containing metal, then you can see it in a CT scan. So, iron gall ink is a classic example. If it's a carbon-based ink, you won't see it on an X-ray scan. Um, so, if there is papyrus used in cartonage or reused somewhere else, and it has ink on it, it's possible that you'll be able to see it. Whether or not you'll be able to read it, that, that's quite complicated, especially if if it's been folded up or, you know, if, if, it, if you've got layers touching layers and you can't separate them out and you can't resolve them in your scan, then it becomes very difficult to um, to, to read it afterwards. And and there's a lot of research on on rat rolled scrolls of, of papyrus or other material where um, they have been able to, to re unravel it virtually and, and read what's written on it. But that's in a fairly controlled, you know, you know it's a scroll, you know it's a spiral that you're, you're dealing with. But yeah, certainly you'd be able to see it if, if there was iron ink on there. Yeah, you probably know this better than better than I do, Monica, but the um, you're, you're, you're obviously aware of the EDUCE project and their, um, their experiments with using um, CT scanning to um, to, to, to virtually unravel scrolls as, as, as Dan's um, talking about. And the thing that struck me about that was that um, we're certainly not, at least not yet, anywhere near the stage of where we can stick one of these things in, in a, even in a really, really high resolution um, CT scanner, get the scan out and suddenly press a button and we can read it. Um, it's a question of you've got a three, you've then got a 3D volumetric model of it and you go through and you trace where you think the, the, the the division between one piece of papyrus and the next piece of papyrus is, and and then you find the traces of of you know of, of iron gall ink in, on the surface, and you sort of peel one back, and you see what's 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 underneath. It's sim similar, um, but but much more painstaking to to the example of the clay envelope that um, that Dan showed, where again you couldn't just take the CT scan and say now we can read it. You had to go through and say okay, I want this layer, and then for the for the for the bit a bit further up, I need to be a few layers further in because it's not flat. Um, and it's it's manual and it's presumably paint uh, painstaking. You made it you made it look very clean and easy, but I bet that took person hours, right? Um, yeah, it, it depends for sure. Yeah, when you've got a curved surface and you're yeah. putting a flat plane across it, then it can be complicated. There's a there's another project called Letter Locking, and they've had some amazing results using X-ray CT to virtually unwrap letters which were folded in very complex manners, and and they've they virtually unwrap them. And I think a lot of computer science, a lot of you know, computational imaging goes into the, the post-processing and unraveling. That's probably 95% of the work and the scanning is 5% of the work. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, okay, we have another question from Megan. Cool question for Dan about the Artex Spider. I actually, if you're able to share my screen, Gabby, um, this, um, yeah. thank you. The the mask is actually on Sketchfab, so Amelia's model of the mask is on Sketchfab, and um, I I don't know if I can share a link with you. I put it in the private chat, Gabby, if if mm -hmm. that's able to be made available. But um, Sketchfab is an online three D model hosting website, so a lot of the British Museum scans that were done by Dan Pett actually are on are on this. Um, are on this website, and this is this is the kind of final render, and the um, the the you see a little bit of a mistake here, like with the scan that you know there's a bit where the light was shining off the cheek, and that should all be gold, and it and it hasn't quite captured it in the um, 
in the structured light scan, just to show you the um, the wireframe as well, though, that's of interest. It, it did capture the surface texture very well, I think. And um, also to go to the, so that's kind of what the surface looks like without the, the final color on the top. So I would say the uncolored version of the mask came out well, but so there were some errors with, uh, with the with the light shining off the off the gold, which is a common error mm -hmm. with this kind of 3D scanning method. And and just with photography, right? I mean, trying to photograph something that's gold or silver is is it's always going to have similar issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question from Eden about what what sorts of materials cause problems for CT scanning? Yeah, it's a very good question. And it's something that I should do more of is to tell you what I can't do rather than just what I can do. So, um, so CT scanning, what you need to be able to do is to take a picture of an object and rotate it through 3D, an X-ray picture, sorry, rotate it through 360 degrees whilst keeping the object in your field of view of your detector. Or you need to somehow stitch lots of images together. So that can get very complicated. It depends on your object, but typically I'm limited in the museum to what I can fit in the field of view of that that square detector. And that that, that means I can typically look at things that are about 25 centimeters wide. Anything wider than that, I struggle. And with the mummy mask, you might have noticed that I, I um, only showed you the, the face and the inside of the face, but not the back of the mask. And that's because the mask itself was too wide to be done in a single scan. So I just focused on that area as a region of interest and cut the, the like to virtually cut the back of the, uh, the mask off. And um, so, yeah, there's a size limitation. Um, and also, certainly with density, there's an issue. So if you have something that's completely stops your x-rays getting through, then you won't, it's just like shining a light on something. You don't have any information about what's inside it. So you need to have a certain amount of x-rays going through your object in order to get a picture. So if you have a piece of lead, we know that that's very good at stopping x-rays because we use it to shield ourselves from x-rays. So you, you can't do a CT scan of lead at the energies that we're using. You, you need to have very powerful x-ray tubes and, and, and still you probably, I don't know if it would be possible anyway. We, what we have in the British Museum is, is a fairly powerful X-ray tube. And by powerful, I mean we apply a very high voltage to it. So 450,000 volts we apply to our, to our, our X-ray tube. Um, so that's 450 kilovolts. A, a medical CT scan is done at 140 kilovolts, just for a comparison. And the reason we go higher is so that we can get through denser material, because that, that voltage converts into the average energy of your X-rays. And the higher your energy, the better it is at going through stuff. So if we turn our power all the way up, we can we can go through thicker materials, but only to a limit. So if we've got five centimeters of metal, we'll we'll struggle to go through it. So there's certainly certainly limits there as well. So the things that we do really well with CT scanning is organic material, so animal remains, human remains, um, things like ceramics as well, that, that, and wood. We're quite good at looking through those, but we struggle with metal. And presumably you need um, the features you're interested in to have con density contrast from each other. So if you're if you've got, you know, as you were saying before, if you've got um, uh, organic ink on, on, on the surface of written on papyrus or, or cloth, it doesn't make that much difference to the density it becomes then very hard to see. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's why the, the tablet was kind of an interesting one, because it was clay inside clay. And the only reason we're able to read the text is there's a small gap between them. But it had been that when so a seal was rolled over the surface of that envelope, which kind of squashed everything together, which made that harder than it maybe would have been in another case. But yeah, it's very difficult when you've got the same material densities. Yeah, definitely. It was the air or 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 empty space in in, in there that you were that you were seeing. Presumably the the thing was sealed in an envelope. With the intention that if needed you could break the envelope and still be able to get get at the object inside and read it so presumably it wasn't rolled entirely flat well i mean yeah the the the, the working theory is that um the reason that was in an envelope was in case of a dispute it would be opened and then it was rolled over with what's called a cylinder seal so that made a kind of 3d impression on the surface by, by rolling the seal over the surface yeah. and um 
and you know, I don't, I don't know if at the time it would have been easier to open that envelope, and four thousand years later, mm -hmm. you know, the, the fact that the tablet is in a different condition now to, to it was then might mean that it's impossible. I mean, there, there, there have been examples of, of um, scholars opening these envelopes in the past, mm -hmm. but I think with this one, yeah, because it was all stuck together, it's basically one blob for the most part. But you probably would break the tablet in half by trying to open the envelope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't think you'd get the, the writing on the inside. And even if you could, we wouldn't we wouldn't want to do that because the envelope itself is a heritage object as well. Which, yes, yeah. and, and also we, we we always need to have a bit of perspective in that the the tablet is four thousand years old. X rays were discovered about one hundred and twenty five years ago, and CT scanning has been used since the seventies, maybe, and in museum contexts, not since maybe since the nineties. So. We're using very modern technology, and who knows what's going to come along, you know, in the next hundred years, two hundred years, that we'll be able to get better images than I do now. Yeah. So rather than damage an object, it's better to better to better to not find out in our lifetimes what it says inside, because someone in the future will. What better technology? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, yeah, the mission statement of our department is um, research, preservation, dissemination, and, and the preservation part is very important. So yeah. if, we, if we can do a measurement without damaging an object, of course, that's how we'll, we'll do it. And if we, if we can't, then we have to really assess if it's worth doing the measurement or the experiment in the first place. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Anyone else? Um, we'll continue to keep an eye on the chat if anyone else posts anything, but, but Paola, Monica? Well, just one short comment about uh, um, Amis and Sarcophagi. We already discussed that in previous sessions. So these uh, possibilities are wonderful for, uh, let's say, not opening sarcophagi. So there is a big discussion how much, how many things do we want to display in museums and collections uh, when we have especially mummies and sarcophagi. So we can explore the inside for scholarly reasons, but on the other side, we want to respect dead people. So this is an open question, an open discussion, but I think that here we can see wonderful possibilities in this direction. And of course, this is a personal, every one of us can think different things about that, but I think this is interesting. I am, there's, there was a document published by the British Museum a few years back called Regarding the Dead. I don't know if you, if you know of it, but um, we, we have a curator who's responsible for human remains in the museum. and. And, the, and the, the mission statement is for them is very much respect, care, and dignity, and only to show human remains where there's a, a purpose for doing so, and there's a, something to be learned or a story to be told, and that that kind of what is what guides um, a lot of the the British Museum's approach to, to human remains display, and and as you say, um, ancient lives was a very very you know popular exhibition, and it and it generated a lot of interest. And the, and the X-ray CT scanning was done by this same person, this is Daniel Antoine, who's our, our curator of human remains. And um, and yeah, it's it's um, it's always a very interesting. It's always worth a, a discussion. I think how 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 we as museums go about that that topic of displaying human remains. Absolutely. Yeah, I was just going to comment on the possibilities even of, for example, merging like CT scan and then 3D printing. So being able to look into the sarcophagus and then print whatever, you, not the body, but maybe some amulets. Um, there was also a case study, you know, some years ago, some amulets in a sarcophagus where you could do the scan and see that they were there and then print them uh, with 3D printing just to be able to touch them and have a further look into those that otherwise you wouldn't be able to see necessarily without opening the sarcophagus. But I think it, it's amazing. And also for, I was wondering for people who want to have access to those models, um, they are available in Sketchfab, no? The British Museum Sketchfab or the like... The, um, so the, the surface scans are on Sketchfab and the CT scans currently aren't. So I, I, I am very, very keen to get CT scans that I've done and the uh, published research available online. It's, uh, it's a bit tricky. We don't really have a very good mechanism for doing it at the moment. It's something I'm in discussions with um, colleagues at the museum about. But as I said before, the, the data sets are so large that it becomes quite tricky to, to make them 
accessible. What, what you can do is just put all the raw data in a, in a repository and then the scholars can view it if they've got the right software and the right computing power. But it's not the best way if you want to kind of, you know, make things more openly available. There, are, mm -hmm. there, there may be other ways of doing it where like, you know, anyone with any computer can look at something. One thing that we've been focusing on quite a lot this semester already is um, is uh, concepts of data and metadata. Um, and um, I wondered if we wanted to think very quickly about the sorts of um, information that you include in any any share of 3D data, whether it's putting the model on on Sketchfab or you know making um, volumetric data downloadable or or anything like that. Is what 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 are the essential pieces of data and metadata that that you that you attach to those um, to those models? Um, we may have temporarily lost Dan, but yeah, um, yeah, we lost Dan. But but the, we can we can all comment on this same question. Yeah, well, I think in terms of metadata for three D modeling, no, we would be looking at oh. Okay. No, carry on. Ah, so main main uh, data I'm thinking like for any of such a 3D model uh, would be like the creator, no, who, who made it, um, with what purpose, um, where it was made, when it was made, and all these sorts of things, mm -hmm. um, what it captures. Um, Technologies. Know. Yeah. Hardware How settings. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So then we are talking about the sort of metadata you will be collecting for, for example, a 3D model. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously the basic fields like creator, date, when, like why it was made, uh, technologies used. Is there anything else that you would be looking into or you would need or you would normally look for when reading the metadata of, for example, a 3D model? Apart from that, I don't know about 3D um, surface scans, but with electricity, there is. Sorry, there is. <laughs> yeah, there's, um, there's quite there's there's quite a bit. Um, there's a bit. There was a paper published on um, metadata standards for CT actually. But there, there are certain things that you need to know. You need to know what kilovolts your X-ray tube is running at, for example, like things like the technical settings of the X-ray tube mm -hmm. and the resolution of your detector, how big the pixels are on your detector, and and then you need to know how far it is from your X-ray tube to your object and from your object to the detector. And that tells you your magnification. And that then tells you how big your voxels are. So then that means you can you can do a measurement and in 3D space of your of your model and and, and you know do dimensional analysis, just for an example. And and you need to know your number of projections, so your number of images that you use to create your image. There's, there's lots of information like that which that means that in, in the future, someone with your raw data can also do a, a 3D reconstruction. And there are different ways of doing it. And they don't give exactly the same results, of course. There are artifacts that are introduced by doing this. And again, it's, if we have the raw data and we have all of that metadata, then in the future, more more uh, sophisticated um, reconstruction methods can be used mm -hmm. to, to make better 3D volumes from the same, same data set. Yeah. Yeah, I think this this that's absolutely um, uh, this this ties in with what Dan Peck was saying about photogrammetry. That he's um, as well as the models that he's made from these, he's made a lot of his photo sets available. And again, there's a link to them on the on the session page. Um, and so he may have created a 3D model from these 200 photographs, but you also have the 200 photographs. And if 10 years later you've got a better 3D, you know, better photogrammetry software, which you know we probably have, um, you could. Use exactly the same photographs to um, to, to to you know to, to, to have another go, um, and knowing something about those photographs is therefore useful. So knowing who took the photographs and all that sort of thing and when that's useful because you'll want to share that data with with your your final model, um, but also just knowing settings like like you know the resolution, the camera model, the lighting, all those sorts of things, um, you know, is, is is extra information that. Um, that would be useful and in a sense that's you know that's making your process reproducible isn't it um 
and also there might be the case where you can't scan something again so you yeah. might have something that doesn't exist anymore or you know has been eroded if it's an, an outside feature and you might have something that you don't want to x-ray again because you're kind of yeah. the dose that it receives of radiation so there's lots of reasons why you might not want to do that so and obviously the time involved and the you know you've got to someone's got to find the object collect the object bring it to a lab take it back again so it's much better if you can use existing data sets yeah yeah there's all sorts of reasons why you might not be able to or want to image something again you know um yeah you went and took some images in the field at one point and for the last 10 years that's been a war zone so you you, you just know you're not going back um all sorts of all sorts of reasons yeah um so yeah the 3d model itself <clears throat> is a a form of virtual conservation of the object but the photographs behind it are even more so yeah, yeah. Um, good anything else that useful to bring up in this context um, um, I don't think so. I think I, I shared my, my Twitter. I mean, if anyone ever mm -hmm. sees the work that I do and has any kind of ideas of, or anything and they want to talk to me or ask me any questions, then I'm always available on Twitter to, to have a chat with someone. Great, thank you. Another thing I, that we haven't mentioned, and I think it would be interesting to maybe look at in the future, is in terms of 3D modeling and museums, how uh, the public engage differently with the 3D model and what it brings to to public mm -hmm. engagement, to, yeah, to visitors, mm -hmm. um, how they understand them, whether they find it useful or not. Like having the sarcophagus and the 3D model of it being able to look inside or the, do the CT scan. Um, yeah, I think it would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Sessions. That could be that could be a whole session, couldn't it? Because there's all sorts of um, all sorts of issues there in terms of, um, you know, we can we can quite quickly start to come up with the benefits for public engagement of making these models, but then there's also the potential potential drawbacks. And you know, people have people are sometimes, for example, concerned that once you start making all these three D things available, um, then they no longer need to show you the real thing. The real thing then doesn't get put on display, or um, people might be concerned conversely that people won't want to come and see the real thing anymore. Um, I don't think that's true. I think that's that's demonstrably not true. The more you see a, a digital version, the more you want to see the real thing. But uh, but certainly people people have concerns in both directions um, in terms of you know what we want from museums is is to visit them. I mean, as much as we as much as we love the the online resources as well, we really want the museum to remain a place that we can visit. Um, and likewise. As much as museums want online visitors, they want in-person visitors even more, um, or at least as much, let's say. I think um, in terms of yeah, using 3D models and digital screens and things like that in a, in a gallery or an exhibition context, I think my philosophy, and I'm sure the museum's philosophy is very much to not distract from the collection, but to enhance someone's understanding of it and to maybe make people stand and, and look at something in a different way and then revisit the object and look at it in a different way than they might have done previously. I think I think that's very important to, to kind of make sure that it's a, to enhance the experience rather than to distract from the collection. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think in terms of engagement as well, like when you look at a model, just being able to move the model around, move the um, look underneath, look on top, like it gives you a, further layer of connection with the object, at least for me, it's, it's like different, like something else, whatever you see, but yeah, it's a different yeah. And, and of course, it's, you know, people who can't get to, for example, the British Museum, because they live in a different country, or they just, they just can't get here. It, it is a way of making the collection available. That is a very powerful, mm -hmm. very powerful thing to be able to do. I mean, there, there is there is still, uh, you know, a certain perspective that is that is actively hostile to some of these um, digital um, approaches 
um, I'm thinking particularly in terms of things like 3D printing. We often talk about 3D printing as a way to, to, to enable people to access the object who couldn't access the, the, the physical object itself. Um, and that there is a certain hostility to that on the grounds that, you know, I, I don't want to no longer have access to the object itself. Um, and that's, you know, and that, that's, that's a, you know, it's been, it's been discussed as an accessibility issue. It's been, you know, um, you know, because, you know, there's no way we're going to let the public go up and, and touch the, um, the bust of Nefertiti, but you can touch this 3D print of it. But that's, that's, you know, sometimes seen as a sort of a cop out. It's so uh, that's not, you know, if, if that's, if, if you're going to do that and then not bother doing anything else for accessibility, then, then we don't want to, you know, it's, 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 it's complex and, yeah, yeah. Think it's, about it's also evolving yeah. as you know as we've said it's all very new technology and approaches yeah. that we're using here i'm not saying it's brand new but i think mm. you know as, as things develop i think more effective methods will will come to the fore and, and that's the way mm. that i think i think you, you do have to have this kind of research trial and error phase with anything yeah. new to find out what works and what doesn't Cool. Thank you. Um, we've reached the end of our allotted time. So um, thank you. Thank you very much again. And thanks also to, to Dan Pett, who had to leave early to go swimming. And um, uh, and please do um, thanks to, to, to the audience, especially those of you who ask questions. Um, please do join us again next week um, for the next session, which will be on a digital heritage thinking, thinking both about uh, born digital heritage and about digitized heritage in um, in general terms, where um, we will be joined by uh, Paula, who um, who's there, and also Rhiannon Lewis from the University of London, the Science Museums Group, and Stella Wisdom from the British Library. So, see you. Um, hopefully, see you then. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks, thank everyone. You so thank you. Then. Bye. Oh, you got it.